Now that we're considering cases where there are several processes running on the same system at the same time, it's worth thinking about how those processes can interact. It turns out there are a number of mechanisms for interprocess communication, and we'll talk briefly about pipes and shared memory, but then focus on the simplest sort of interprocess communication in Linux using signals. A pipe is a way that we can turn the output of one process into the input of another. If I run this C program called first, so this program repeatedly gets a line from standard in, finds the first space in that line, and then prints everything up to that space. When we read from standard in, that normally means we are reading input that the user types at the terminal. But with pipes, we can also get our input from some other program's output. For example, the program cat dumps the contents of a file to the terminal. And so when I run it on this txt file, it will print out everything in that file. But I can also run cat and then a pipe, and now the output of cat will become the input to my first program. And so, instead of waiting for the user to type input on the command line, the first program is just reading each line of output that comes from cat, and just like before, it's printing the first word on each line. One common application of pipes is to search through the output that a program produces. Suppose I wanted to list the contents of the current directory, and for some directories that have a whole lot of files, this output might be extremely long and hard to read. So if there's a particular type of file that I'm looking for, I could pipe the output of ls into the program grep. Grep is a program that just searches for lines in its input that contain some particular text string. And so if I search for the characters txt, then we get only the one line of output from ls that included the string txt. So pipes can be extremely handy, but they only allow a limited sort of one-way communication. On the other end of the spectrum, if we want to allow processes any sort of communication, one mechanism we can use is to set up memory that is shared between those processes. That way, each process can read and write data in that section of memory, which allows arbitrarily complicated communication, but also makes for some serious implementation challenges in that it's up to the programmer to ensure that those processes are not interfering with one another's use of that memory. On Linux, the shm git system call sets up shared memory. We know this is a system call because it appears in section 2 of the manual, and the basic idea is that this will create a region in the virtual memory of each process that maps to the same region of physical memory, so that each process can read and write the corresponding region of its virtual memory, and since the page tables are mapping those to the same physical memory, changes made by one process will be visible to the other. There's much more depth that we could go into on these and other ways for processes to share data, but for the rest of this video, I want to focus on the simplest type of interprocess communication called signals. A signal is a way for the operating system to deliver a message to a running process. And it turns out we've seen several types of signals before. For example, this program that allocates a small chunk of memory and then accesses far beyond it should produce a seg fault. When your program tries to access memory that it hasn't been allocated, the operating system delivers a segmentation fault signal to your process. And as we know, the result of receiving a segmentation fault signal is usually to crash the program. Another signal we've seen before is the interrupt signal. If we run a program that has an infinite loop, we know we can kill it 
by pressing Control C at the terminal. But when we type Control C, what's actually happening is that the operating system delivers an interrupt signal to the process. And again, the default behavior when receiving this signal is to terminate the process. But what if I were to run this infinite loop program in the background? Now I have my terminal back, and I can press Control C all I want, but that infinite loop program is still running. So how could I send a signal to terminate this process? Well, it turns out there is a command line utility to send signals to processes. That utility is somewhat confusingly named kill, and we can view its Linux manual entry. The reason this utility is named kill is because the most common use is to send a signal that will kill a runaway process. But in fact, we can use kill to send any signal we want, and we can list all of the available signals with minus L. So if I want to use this utility to send an interrupt signal, I can use the code 2. The particular signal we are sending is an option, so we do minus 2 to send signal number 2, and then we need to give the ID of the process that we want to receive that signal. According to our PS output from before, the loop program has this process ID, and if I send it an interrupt signal and then run PS again, we see that the loop program is no longer running because it was terminated by an interrupt signal. For most of the possible signals that we can send, the default behavior is, just like for interrupt and segfault, to terminate the process. But for many of the signals, we can change that default behavior. We do that using the system call signal. I think this system call is also confusingly named because it should really be called register signal handler. When we call the signal function, we are not actually sending or receiving a signal. Instead, we are telling the operating system what behavior we want to have in the future when our process receives certain types of signals. To use this system call, we need to include the corresponding library. And then we can use the signal system call to register other behaviors in response to various signals. This function takes two arguments, which are which signal we want to change the behavior for, and what behavior we want to register. To begin with, the simplest behavior we could register is to ignore the signal. As a part of the signal.h library, we have also included a number of constants, so we can list the signal that we're registering a behavior for by name, and we have also gotten some possible behaviors we can register, like to ignore the signal. If we save this and recompile, and now we run our loop program in the background again, if we try to send an interrupt signal to this process, let's see what happens. In this case, the process is still running because we registered that Every time this program receives an interrupt signal, we want the ignore behavior. But we could still kill this process by sending it some other signal. For example, we could send it signuser1, which is intended as a signal whose behavior will be defined by the user. And now we see that our loop program has terminated. Of note, this will also have the effect that if we run this in the foreground, when we hit Control c it's no longer killing the program. And so in this case, I would want to use another terminal to find the process ID and send a signal to kill the runaway process. And back in the original terminal, our process has been killed. In this case, I gave the signal minus 9, 
and minus 9 refers to the kill signal. Let's see what would happen if we tried to ignore the kill signal. In this case, we tried to register a signal handler for the kill signal, but this is a signal whose default behavior cannot be changed. And that's a good thing, because we can count on, no matter what a process has done to make itself hard to kill, we can always use kill minus nine to send it a kill signal and terminate its execution. It turns out there's another place that we've already seen signals, which is when a parent process waits for its child. In this program, the call to fork will return a positive number in the parent process and zero in the child, so the parent will go into the if statement and wait while the child process enters the infinite loop. So if we run this program, and then wait a few seconds and call ps, we see that the fork succeeded, giving us two copies of the process, but one of them has been running for several seconds, whereas the other's execution time rounds down to zero. The process that has been waiting is the one with the smaller process ID, and so it is the child process that is actively running on the CPU. Now, if we were to send a kill signal to the child process and then run ps again, we see that the parent process now has a non-zero execution time. It turns out that the way the information is communicated, that the child process has completed and the parent can resume execution, is by a signal. Specifically, whenever a child process exits, the operating system delivers a sig child signal to its parent. And we can demonstrate this by setting up a slightly more interesting signal handler. I've now modified the program to register a handler for the sig child signal. And the handler that we have specified is a function we defined called print message. When we register a signal handler, the function that we give it has to have a very specific function signature. It has to have a return type of void, and it has to take a single int as its input. And in this case, the handler function we have written simply prints out that a signal was received and prints out the number of that signal. So if we compile and run in the background and wait a few moments, then again, we see a child process that is executing and a parent that is waiting. But now if we send a kill signal to the child, we see that the parent process is now executing again. And we see that the signal handler in the parent process was called. So we deliberately sent a kill signal to the child process, and then when that process was terminated, its parent was automatically sent a child signal, and since we registered a handler for sig child, that caused our print message function to be executed. And then when the signal handler returns, the process will continue executing from wherever it was. And in this case, that means it will continue executing right after the wait, and it's now running in the infinite loop. So in summary, there are lots of ways processes can communicate. Pipes are a handy way of turning one process's output into another's input, and those get used a lot at the terminal. There are much more complicated mechanisms, including shared memory, that can allow way more communication between processes. And there are also other mechanisms in between. And signals are a way for the operating system to deliver a simple message to a process. And for most signals, the default behavior is to terminate that process. But for many signals, we can change the way our program responds, 
by registering a signal handler.